Hi, Mark. How has your pandemic been, Anne? Oh my goodness. Uh, pretty busy. I've been, I've been to Mexico twice. <laughs> We've made it this far, huh? Yeah. I went to Mexico twice because I- You've, back. pardon? Can you hear me? Oh. My uh -huh. God, I was born in Mexico, yeah. having a rough time. And it, I, I, first time I went, uh, August, mm -hmm. the first year was, um, I was in a hazmat suit. It was that bad that was before you know getting vaccinated oh my gosh so that's been intense but they're doing fine yeah. they'll try to visit um colorado and then new york this summer she's she was born at the equinox so she's over a year year now and walking very adorable but that's been <laughs> intense as you can imagine and then i've been you know working at naropa of course and working on some textbooks and it actually was a good work year from some point of view but also very traumatic how about you how are things at bennington bennington is um you know there were advantages to being in a small college on a mountainside in rural vermont <laughs> i mean it was uh you, you know it, it stayed there um uh, you actually stayed i there. wasn't actually I didn't, I didn't teach on campus this last term, but students were there, you know, the undergraduates were there and it was almost, a, you know, I wouldn't call it a normal year, but um, it was, you know, um, the college managed. So it was, all of that was really good. And, um, you know, incoming class in the fall is the biggest it's ever been. So, Amazing. you know, I feel, it feels like a kind of, um, like we made it through, made it through something, yeah. but yeah, but I here it's been fine right now. I'm actually at my mother's home and I'm in a childhood bedroom here, uh, in Wisconsin. So I visited my mother for the first time in a year and a half. So oh, that's, that's Sandra, who you might see on the screen. That's her. She's watching okay. the reading live in the other room. Right. Terrific. <laughs> Wonderful. Very good. So. Yeah, I've been busy with a lot of Zoom things, of course. It's tapering off and I'm in New York now. It's very hard to be in New York that's now rebooted and very, very busy. I'm in the West Village, which is just, I mean, there are five restaurants that are just open all the time and celebratory and makes me a little nervous because it was a bit more monastic in Colorado. But um, yeah, I'm staying a little longer than I'd anticipated, but I'll be back in the fall. This is really home base. But I got used to the, the more quiet, um, you know, sequester. It's like having a residency. <laughs> I know. I was I was um, uh, talking to Mary Rufel, and uh, at one point, in midway through the pandemic, and she said, "She's like, there's something to really, there's something, <laughs> you know, about this that I'm gonna miss when it's over." You know, I mean, she was saying like, she just stays home. She's in her doing her work. She said that it's been very and I, I, there's some of that that I certainly, you know, I mean, for people with shelves full of books, active, you know, preoccupied and active imaginations, I think it was, you know. 
very we, helpful. We've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> I know you don't have to go to Yaddo or, um, you know, find a good literary residency and just True. sit some in your day. Anyway, yeah, it's, it, it's hard with, I have friends in India and I have friends in, of course, in Mexico, family in Mexico, and I have, you know, people in South America. There's an Europa student who's from Colombia and it's been very rough there um, and it's not getting any better. So and it's that's, not over, it's not over. Uh, not over by any means. That's right. And I, I was sort of a former student who's at Cambridge in the UK and, you know, they're very careful and uh, England is not, you know, it's just not doing that well. So, yeah, we yeah, have to it's be... going to be. Uh, the summer isn't, I know, we, I, have, I have big hopes for the summer of things improving and, you know, but it's going to be a you know we'll we'll see more waves i think certainly and i see the the good people at the grillier hi are here you're good i'm doing zoom thank you just are we muted can you hear us i can hear you oh, yeah oh. hi how Welcome. are you guys hi good to see you yeah that beautiful store Terrific. Thanks for having to read. Yeah, we're so excited. We wish we could host wow. it here, but maybe we will in a year or so we can do a reunion. Wonderful. Yeah. I have very, very fond memories of the one reading I gave there at the Grillier, which was um, many years ago. And it was so wonderful because it just packs full and then people stand out on the sidewalk and look in through the big windows. It's the most exciting thing in the world <laughs> to read to a, you know, in a shrine like that. Um, the shrine. Beautiful. Yeah. I read there so long ago, I can't even remember. It's way back, way back. And the reason, right? And the reason was yeah. So um, uh, I'm guessing we're probably broadcasting to the people who are signing in here. They're probably listening in, so we should be aware of that. Um, and I got the, um, uh, just the, I'm, I'm prepared to read for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. If that's what you want, I will go first. Um, I can do shorter, whatever it is you, you prefer. So um, let me know. And I'm really so honored to to open for you, oh, Anne. What a what a treat it is. It's a very for me to, to, it's to, a share, very to share it's a very book. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm delighted. Yeah. I'm delighted. Thank you. Will we see Sandra? Is she going to stay unseen? Your mother. I think she's going to remain unseen. My mother. I can um I can go ask her. She might say, Sandra's my mother. She's listening in in the other room. I'm home in Wisconsin. That's where, that's where I am right now. So um, I may just mute myself, shut off my camera, go to make sure she's able to hear everything OK, and be right back in two shakes. Sounds good. And how was your day today? It was a little busy. It's very, um, I don't know, frenetic in New York. It's so much more traffic just in the last week. And I have to be here now till the 10th and then I'll go back to Boulder and then I'll be back in the fall. This is really home base, but I hadn't expected to be here right now. I have some responsibilities at Naropa back in Boulder. So- um, Summer session begins for that. Yeah, we have an, on it's online again this summer but it's still, it's run from there. And we do have some of the students are, are in town and we've, we've designed the program for the, our, our core MFA, you know, and they're, so they can graduate and get all their, you know, work done and requirements. So it's not really an open program to, I mean, we, we let people come to some of the lectures and readings, but um, you know, it's a more intimate setting, but it's still very important and very busy for three weeks. So I need to get back to that. And, um, but the city is, I, I, you know, I arrived when it was just rebooting and it was somewhat of a shock. 
because I was coming from a pretty quiet situation, also very, very cautious, even after you know the vaccinations. Boulder still considered high risk. I miss New York. I haven't been there in a while. I still go there frequently, but I haven't been since the pandemic. Oh, really? It's it's gotten. I don't know. It's even more extreme than it was when I left. Yeah, it keeps changing. You know, every day there's a new high-rise building there. Especially down near the West Village. It's oh there. my gosh! Yeah, which is where I live. I'm on McDougal Street. Right. And it's just yeah. building, lots of buildings, and actually, uh, Disney is moving their executive offices and has taken over a whole city block which they're building, they're building their own executive uh, palace. I don't know what it's going to, it's going to be a self-contained world. I'm sure they'll have all the restaurants they need and this and that. I mean, we're, we're a little worried in the neighborhood. It's, yeah. it's already crowded and enough. That you could want the Olive Gardens and the Applebee's. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah. But it's still, you know, the museums have opened. I've been able to go to a few things. People are being pretty careful. And I don't think the tourists have arrived yet, but that will get even more intense. I think we have, to, it's a time for caution. I think we should be you know, a little wary of some of the waves predicted. Yeah. And are things pretty busy in your neighborhood? Things are in session at Harvard and- It's interesting because today, I think it might've been Harvard's graduation day. Oh. And there was nobody around. You know, there's some, a few people walking around with the robes on and so forth and some family members all dressed up. But usually, um, you know, pre-pandemic, this was one of the busiest days of the year. Yes, of people course. People flowing in from the streets and all these people who remember when they were at Harvard and they came through the earlier. So um, it's pretty it was fascinating. Still a pretty decent day. I mean, it was decent, but it's not anything like what it was. You know, it's kind of fascinating. Because mm -hmm. you know, the graduation, I think, was mostly online. And oh, dear. Uh, it's just a strange, it's very strange. I mean, I, I, I heard what you and Mark were saying earlier about this a lot of benefits. <laughs> So this, for, for example, you know, I was loving being home and being able to do work from there and to do, you know, 
things that I needed to do and to have some peace and all of that and for the planet to get a little bit of healing. But it seems like now, um, in a lot of ways, things are right back to what they were pre-pandemic in terms of flying and, you know, I just flew to Austin and, and it was a regular experience. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, James. Hi, hey, Dan and Mark and everybody. Hi. I like seeing the backdrop of the store. We wanted to make sure we could do hybrid events in the future, so we sort of uh, just last moment decided to see if we could stream it in here, and it's working great, you know? Yeah, it almost looks like a, a fake screen. It's so nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's the real deal. <laughs> yeah. So, Gee, do you know Ann Waldman? I haven't met you before. Oh, I haven't met you. Hi. Nice Great to, meet, to you. meet you. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. And Mark Wunderlich on TV and TV. She's um, Dasani's daughter and she's taken over the school. Um, I'm trouble hearing. Okay. Me too. Can't hear us. Yeah, just make sure you speak into the, uh, uh, just Elizabeth faded out, but I could hear you before. Anyway, Didi is now owner of the store. Um, hey, congratulations. Bonnie's daughter. Just, I'm helping, helping my mom. <laughs> my mom is on a train right now, but she had to make sure to thank you both for being here. She's going to try and join with her phone, but she's not exactly savvy on Zoom, uh, <laughs> particularly from mobile oh, phones. <laughs> um, hi, Mark. Hello, good to meet you. Yeah, thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Hi, Johnny and... Hi, Dee Dee. Hi, hi, Melissa. How's it going? Good. <laughs> hi, Anne. Hi, hi, Melissa, I haven't seen you in so long. It has been a really long time. It's great, you haven't aged a fraction. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I follow you somewhat. I, I'm delighted to see you here. This is great. Well, I came to see you. I came to see and hear you. It's been too long. Oh. Yeah. Brilliant. I love your glasses. Oh. <laughs> They're oh. fantastic. They're just drugstore, but they work. Yay. <laughs> My dad swore by drugstore glasses. <laughs> I could lose them so quickly. I, you know, I would be without them. You know, without drugstore glasses, impossible. I'd be in terrible debt. From <laughs> real glasses. Well, it's a strange uh, thing. I cannot buy drugstore glasses because I have one far-sighted and one nearsighted eye. So that's not a world I can venture into. Hmm. <laughs> Aren't they mostly for far-sighted people? Far people? Or glasses, or I guess. Glasses, you have an echo. Have an echo. Oh, we all have an echo. We all have an echo. Sydney. Does anyone have it on? Does anyone have it on? Somebody say hello, Sydney. I did. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, nice to Hi, see you again. Oh, my goodness. It's been a long time. Long time. Yep. <laughs> About a year and a half. Yeah. I'm here with my daughter, Erica. Who is also a Bennington, who is also a Bennington graduate and uh, and who really is someone whose work I have read and admired and loved for so long. And so, and it's thrilling to, for me to be able to share the stage. The first poem that I'm going to read is the first poem in, uh, in my book, God of Nothingness, which just came out. And it's a, a book, a, a poem that um, is about my last name. Um, I, I have one of those last names that people ask questions about. Um, it's, it's obviously 
Um, ethnic, it, uh, people think that it means, people will ask, does it mean wonderful? And in fact, it doesn't mean anything like that at all. So this is a poem about my name, Wonderlick. The name means odd. The name means queer. It can denote an odd fish. It suggests a queer chap. Sometimes it means capricious. It can also mean peevish. It's a synonym for singular. It is thought to be poetic. The Pied Piper of Hamlin was called Ein Wunderlicher Kautz, with his colorful clothing come to pipe the rats away. He drowned them in the vaser, or so the stories go. When the mayor withheld payment, he took the children and drowned them with the rats. Or perhaps they went into the mountains or they moved to Transylvania. It is 100 years since our children left, says the crumbling book found in the church. That is what it means to be a wonderlick. The name means strange things happen to him. It means he can be disputatious. It means he sometimes wears peculiar garments to a party, that as he aged, he seemed younger, less reliable, more in touch with what he would call his soul. You might not call it that yourself. It can mean quarrelsome. It can mean he prefers cats. It can mean he has a gnome tattooed near the hair underneath his arm. It means he loves Christmas like a simpleton. It means makes sushi out of spam. The name means curious, as in he bought a haunted house, and since weaning, he's not touched a woman's breast. It means he loves the color orange. It means he studied Dutch. It means pancakes for supper once again this week, and that he prefers to knit his own socks. The name means an electric organ maestro. The name means famous botanical illustrator. It means the drunken tenor ass over tea kettle down a set of Viennese stairs. It is true there are few of us that we have spread ourselves thin around the globe, find us making wine in Hungary, herding cattle in Namibia, captaining a ship somewhere off the Chilean coast. My wonderlicks steamed up the long brown Mississippi in a boat that put them and their peculiarities off in Wisconsin, where the name means a shady farm growing a crop of moss on a roof, an old man with a pistol in his pants, a child who didn't survive and occupies a pagan's ashy grave atop a limestone bluff, where the wind speaks his strange name or worse, voices recognition an attribution or a curse. So I, I should mention that I'm broadcasting live here today from a childhood bedroom. I'm actually in my, uh, in my, in my hometown, my mother's house. Um, so some of these poems have to do with the place that I'm actually reading from. This is a poem um, about this town where I am right now, and it's called A Driftless Sun. Um, the Driftless Zone is a part of uh, Wisconsin, a little corner of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, where during the last um, ice age, the glacier kind of came down and went around this little area. So rather than being sort of flat, uh, as much of the Midwest is, it's uh, there are craggy limestone bluffs and a sort of deep river valley. Um, and it's a, a landscape that's both beautiful and uh, even sometimes kind of mysterious. And it's called the Driftless Zone. This is called A Driftless Sun. It came to me to sell the family farm, shift its failures to a man who planned to occupy the place for recreation to hunt the deer that spook and shadow in the pines, my job to consign to another my granddad's stunted grove of walnuts planted against the forester's advice with his hired man, Tiny, who died by stepping in front of a train, though first he roped his dog, Bear, to a nearby tree, tacking on a note that read, take care off me. 
Does anyone remember this fat fact? A loaf of toast and a dozen eggs was Tiny's daily breakfast meal. Give it to me. I'll remember that bit too. I fished the muddy pond just once, its manure slurry slipped downstream from the Tullius brothers' hogs, shot the one buck trophy down my wall, whose crippled hoof had slowed him dangerously down. In town again, I pulled the locks off all the doors of the barn, empty now, October now, the deer not yet come to any harm. This is another one set here in this area, and it's called Ha Ha Little Hunchback. Ha Ha Little Hunchback, look at him pretend to trip teeth in his pocket, ring the doorbell three times and make the children clap. He taught me to run a bandsaw and run a chainsaw, cut a key from a blank key, how to break into a car through the window without breaking the window. He fixed slot machines and gumball machines, made mechanical decoys with pulleys and weights. Verstehst du, Bub, he'd ask and I'd nod, but I usually didn't understand the little hunchback. At nine, I couldn't drive, so he taught me to drive. We'd cruise the corn stubble with the noses of our midget guns poked out the windows of the Jeep. His, the Black Prince, mine, Little Red Fox, blocks on the pedals so both of us could reach. We'd shoot squirrels and we'd shoot ruffed grouse, and when I shot a pheasant cock, he had the feathers made into a fancy band for a hat. Good enough for who it's for, he'd say, tapping in a crooked carpentry nail. He made his money in moonshine sugar, made his money making bad luck loans, hired a giant everyone called Tiny, then he became Tiny's home. His teeth pinched so he didn't wear them. His idea of a lady's gift was a meat slicer he knew she'd have to wash. But who wouldn't want to ponder a moon of pink baloney slipped fresh into an outstretched palm? As a child, he'd hitch up his angry pony and beat it all the way to the train to fetch the bales of tobacco and haul them to the shop. If he dawdled and was late, Grandpa Adolf would unbuckle his wooden leg and leave it napping on a chair, then beat his little hunchback with a cane. Little hunchback, little hunchback, never you be late again. It's a little gothic family history for you. Um, this next poem is um, is an elegy for a, a friend, and um, and she was my teacher and mentor, Lucy Brock Broido, who is a, a poet of Cambridge, who of course lived there for many years, and uh, she died in 2018. This poem is called uh, Gone is Gone. I was there at the edge of never, of once been, bearing the night's hide stretched across the night sky, awake with myself, disappointing myself, armed, legged, and torsoed in the bed, my head occupied by enemy forces, mind not lost entire, but wandering off the marked path ill advisedly. This march Lucy up and died and the funny show of her smoky-throated world began to fade. I didn't know how much of me was made by her, but now I know that the spooky art in which we staple a thing to our best sketch of a thing was done under her direction. And here I am at 4 a.m. scratching a green pen over a notebook bound in red leather in October. It's too warm for a fire. She'd hate that. And the cats appear here only as apparitions I glimpse sleeping in a chair. Then, wohin bist du entschwunden? I wise up, know their likenesses are only inked on my shoulder's skin, their chipped ash poured in twin cinerary jars downstairs. Gone is gone, said the goose to the shrunken boy in the mean-spirited Swedish children's book I love. I shouldn't be writing this at this age or any other. 
She mothered a part of me that needed that, lit a spirit lantern to spin shapes inside my obituary head, even though I'm nearly certain now she's dead. Um, this next poem is, uh, it's written in rhyming couplets, sort of loose rhyming couplets or heroic couplets. I don't think I need to say anything about it really, um, except that I had John Clare's wonderful and heartbreaking poem, The Badger, in mind when I was working on it. It's called Cuthbert. I had a lamb and named him Cuthbert. Cuthbert was what I named my little lamb. I fed him oats and I fed him corn. I fed him on the clover flush with spring. I pet and patted Cuthbert every day, fed him on the brightest summer hay. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, how he grew. I knew then what Cuthbert didn't know. I trained Cuthbert daily for the fair, led him with a gleaming halter in a ring. Spring drew on and dully led to summer. My little lamb was now a market weather. We took him in a trailer to the show. He bedded down in bright sawdust in his stall. I blackened Cuthbert's pretty cloven hooves. I carded Cuthbert's haunches with a comb. I oiled his black muzzle until it shone and the day came to take him to the ring. The livestock judge opened Cuthbert's mouth, examined Cuthbert's single row of teeth. He patted hands on Cuthbert's meaty loin, moved us into a single showman's line. The judge returned, walked off, came back again, pulled us from the lineup and then said, this market weather was the finest in his class. That night, I put Cuthbert on the block. The auctioneer sang the money from the crowd. Cuthbert stood tensely and I was proud. A banker bid the highest for the lamb. I led him through the sawdust to his pen, fed him a laudatory meal in his pan. By morning, the stalls stood empty in a row and we children were invited to the show of the carcasses of market lambs and hogs, of Hereford steers trained docile as a dog. The bodies stripped of hides hung on their hooks. We filed past them casting furtive looks. The carcasses bright surface white with fat, the room chilled cold enough so that the meat we grew stayed incorruptible and fresh. We exited the abattoir's cold light and in the concrete hallway was the sight of heads struck dumb and staring by the door under plastic sheeting on the floor to be taken to the mink farm, we were told, for every precious portion had been sold. His head looked out at nothing he could see. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, you have nothing left for me. Um, this has uh, a line in German in it, um, which translates as, he died, he is dead, a dead person. So I'll read it in German, that's the translation. It's called Proposition. That the smell of cows drifting in the open window is indeed that of a living beast that I too am a living beast, that the body I possess is inhabited only by me, that my body is neither at rest nor occupied by dramatic motion, that I am by my best account fully alive, that the room in which I am seated is in Germany, in a town called Vorpsvede, that a poet I admire once lived here too, though he is long since dead. Rilke wrote that I gently wipe away the look of suffered injustice sometimes hinders the pure motion of spirits a little. 
that there are such things as spirits, that we were born suffering, but that we are not meant to suffer, that the wind blows and the birches outside my window sing a little, and that cooing and chucking of the dove I hear is also a kind of song. That the difference between the living and the dead is mostly one of conjugation. Er starb, er ist gestorben, ein gestorbenes Mensch. That what we make when we speak is a kind of music, but disjointed, and that music seeks a unity that our speech does not possess. Once I felt as though I was dead, but now the reasons for that feeling baffle me. I marvel at what it is to feel the sun on my skin. Burnish is the word that comes into my head. Burnished by the sun, as if my torso was a copper shield. That my torso is a kind of shield, protecting the inside from the outside. Though as we all know, we are penetrable in many ways. I'm just gonna read one more. Um, I, gave, I gave my students the assignment, I was thinking about all of those sort of wonderful and strange poems of Emily Dickinson where she's imagining herself already dead and she's sort of speaking from beyond. And I thought a lot about also the Duino elegies that seem to occupy this kind of posthumous voice where the voice of that speaker seems to be speaking about the lived life in the present, but seems to be doing it from a place of, of great remove from having already passed over to the other side. I gave my, my students the assignment to imagine themselves to narrate a, a poem to sort of speak to the future um, from from that from that other state, and so I, of course, had to had to make that attempt myself. So this is the the final poem in the book, and it's called "To Whom It May Concern." In the Polaroid in the drawer of the house, the other relatives picked over. I'm the blur in the background, mop of silvery hair. The rasp of the ash pan when you empty the stove is a bit like my voice, stuck in the chimney like a nest. You won't have to know how I procrastinated of my abiding fear of snakes or how I gave terrible presents when I bothered to give them at all. I was told by a psychic to remember the unloved dead. And so I did, but not in a way they would like recalling how they got ugly when they drank or stole the loose change from the laundry when they thought nobody saw. I spent years writing my last letters, writing off the debt of a cold bed, pretending I was busy when really I was home, pinned to the couch by a cat. For money, I did many things, trapped muskrats, forged thank you notes, let men pet me while I danced. Mostly, I played the role of someone who cared, tilted in my chair and trying to appear engaged, the preoccupied uncle you weren't quite sure you liked. That's me smoking in the Winnebago, leaving the sink clean of hair. I'm there deadheading the rhubarb nobody bothers to pick, and my worthless collections, rag rugs, concrete gnomes, were most likely put out in the trash. Sometimes I lied when I was bored. I wanted you to know what I knew, though I eventually gave that up, preferring to make you laugh. This life I led was mostly private, and hours were spent sweeping bat guano from a crumbling set of stairs. Nobody knew the half of it, and nobody seemed to care. I foresaw how neglected the town cemetery became, glimpsed in a vision, the rusted fence that let in the deer. They stripped the bark from the junipers that eventually came down in a storm. I was in that storm, 
blown out across the ice toward Arcadia. That's a town in Wisconsin and not some name for paradise. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. That was wonderful. And I love that you're reading from your childhood home. <laughs> um, let me see. Everyone take note that in the chat box, I've included a list to um, the bookshop list of all, all the books by Anne and Mark that you can purchase directly from bookshop.org if you just follow that link. Um, James has put that together. Um, and also Mark's uh, personal website where you can read a lot more about him. Um, next up, we have Anne Waldman. Anne is the author of more than 40 collections of poems. She received her BA from Bennington and she's an active member of the outdoor experimental poetry movement and has been connected to the beat movement and the second generation of the New York School with Allen Ginsberg. Sorry, with Allen Ginsberg in 1974, Waldman founded the Jack Couric School of Disembodied Poetics at the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, where she continues to teach to this day. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mark, for that reading. I love the poem for Lucy Brock Brado, the sense of the, the spooky art and the, um, what was it, the sp spirit lantern. Yeah, very dear. And I thought about, I have some old poem about my name, Waldemann, another German name, the woods, woodsman and so on. And I think the woods, I don't know, they were woodsmen who got into, made boats and then got over here and became glass blowers. You know, it made me think about all that, really terrific. So I, I thought I'd start with something recent. Um, this last um, year and, and more uh, was working with a, seminar from the Tomas Foundation and working with some writers involved with the Persian talisman tradition. And um, it was meant to, you know, be a trigger for a certain kind of um, work, you know, geomancy and playing with some of these ideas that would, um, you know, generate our own. Uh, and, you know, we'd listen to things and I've, I've always loved uh, Ibn Sina, and um, anyway, these are three parables. And I was invited after a trip to the Harvard Divinity School, the Center for the Study of World Religions, uh, the magazine Peripheries had asked me for some work. So these are coming up soon in that interesting magazine. And there are three pieces. One is three parables, blood moon, blue moon's omens, and then Avicinnan. Avicinnan's medicine. And I was in Colorado for most of the um, pandemic, the continuing pandemic. Many other people are suffering around the world, but uh, we had some fires, serious fires out there. And the, suddenly the blood, the would be these blood red moons and often magenta suns smoke from the uh, nearby fires. Of course, California was much worse, but this was at that time. Uh, that I was working on these. Blood Moon. As geomancer, she was investigating, inventing out of her time a lash, a leash to pull, to call you back. Is this the longest or shortest century? Look into your human detonation. Astrological signs were a prominent motif in Zoroastrian apocalyptic texts. As the end of the current millennium approaches, they might say, they might have said, they will be saying, there would be signs, miracles, and wonders. Nisan, Abdith, Skoftith, I can't pronounce this, Denkard. Each century ends with an eclipse. The year, month, and day will become one third shorter, the night brighter. The sun will show a mist, the moon will change color, earthquakes and violent winds will occur. Mercury and Jupiter will arrange rulership for the wicked. They say, they have said, they will be saying it over and over, scrying the fallen cities. And he will not heed the votes, never say his name, or he will materialize at greater speed. Later, reading the sand, quote, kinship will never come to the problematized one. 
When the planet Jupiter attains its exaltation and casts down Venus, it will be a soldered sounder over, sing over, sing over. When Jupiter and Saturn meet, it will be a conjunct, your trine, your eclipse, don't wander. What rules, what problem to call him out? Shame, shame, fretting the skies. Shame, shame, he is blurred in the text, the polarizing one. Would you please make the count come right down on him? Count it out, count it out. The moon turns blood in the fire of our time on him, blood on his hands, intub intubation in the cenotaphs, in kinship or out of broken nation. Venus up in arms, copying the night, not say his name. There is division, word too dangerous to be spoken to. In the strobing cinematic camera, it's dangerous. Firearms on display, poised, aim a trigger in your belly, sand on the floors of state. In the dream of battle scene, Persepolis heaving, I'm called to this, called to this. When a primary trigger has been dislodged, will you be ready? I see the way rooms divide, sliced, and the commander is saying, a small mechanism, just push, will you ready it? Militia with a bullhorn on the lawn, threat of lynching, hide before activated. We're, we're, pro we're, we're, we're protesting, we're in Detroit hissing interception. Come out, come out, a flock of birds because they register freedom on the border of cruelty. Oh, American citizens, test of vision, long tentacles of liberation. Will they hold ground, hold blessed ground, stay and hold, never reduce to bare life, astral omens fighting Conditio inhumana. Blue moon's origins and omens. An X as in an hourglass, militia with a megaphone on the lawn, hide before it is activated. Foresight by earth, by things that crawl and hide. In a science of the sands, one wept at the border of cruelty, El Paso. One wept at the border of interception. A flock of birds is intervention because they register freedom and you are not seen. Your language is a cry. Look down at your feet, look up at your wings. Gaze down to your palm now. The broken line is a cry. A ceramic figure that is a hand represents detonation. That is the dream and everyone in sync. As in a square dance and swaying before the tanks arrive, they speak of Jupiter attaining exhalation and casting down of Venus, inscription of wandering planets to stay amused, age of mirage without shame, never back to the dominant gaze. Oh, spare us, Galileo not pardoned till the 1900s, 38 degrees into Aries, mystic, empathetic, Pisces, water nymph will be trailing behind. Moon in Aquarius and cancer rising for otherliness. Oh, hazy prophecy. Oh, full moon of autumn. Are you omniscient? When leaves turn red, that is a cry. Or fires obscure the sky. From Cameron Peak and the fork of Williams, unstoppable flames rage through night and day. Astral omens these days. Cinematics of planetary abuse don't help. Cosmic chords out of whack. These days, these days, I will be the art angel of all divination and show up. Ashes rain down on efficacy. The night too, they do this. Babylon, solar, lunar, and planetary theory of the cures, Seleucids, and Parthian period to remember, study its syntaxis for poets. I am on your nighttime star now. And now we try to rein in the pathological governance to be as asterism reckoners, zodiac tellers, time knowers. In this dream of a horoscope of the world, a lucky auspice would be a throne including one, machinery to mimic weather, we will need this, two, living as replicants, hiding our shame, three, we want the mystery of our power, crystallomancy, harvest moon, you're the start of legitimacy again, must Harvest crops late into the night, crops of saying how all things are done in parable, must have crops for the runic prophecy to grow, stations of the night in state of repose, cold blue hearted moon still out there, the children will come with warm hearts after centuries of disuse, despair. There was a category four that destroyed corn and we had the second hottest month in the recorded history of the world. And when we opened the Arctic National Wildlife 
refuge to ravage, our hearts went down. It was a bleak horoscope told us, as scientists might tell, ghost hurricanes and paramilitaries. Avicen in medicine, this, this is kind of a conversation. Seven planets passing as migrants through the constellations of the zodiac. And as we turn, we just come out rounded, we had just climbed, beaten path to gaze. I said, is this the visionary recital we wait for? Or I said, how great this universe, sick of old formulas, obstacles, because we have been down so long. I said more, and you said diamonds, liquid nitrogen, crux in the sky. And you said, could you see us partnering in this crime? And you were amused. Remember the cavern, the state of abodes, Imago Mundi, and you again, silently. I said, what did we accomplish? We just came out, started spinning. Here is our vocabulary, but I'll carry you. It was difficult to remember why, and you said why, and why carry? And silently, I thought, were we sick? How sick were we? We held down so long, surveillance of one another without light, counting heavenly bodies on hands, in head, reading the dust particles as talisman. Do no harm, Ibn Sina said. Stop counting death. We carried something that stuck to us. Was it capitalism? Shake it off, shake it off, wake up. And you said, we need to proclaim a song where we'd been coming out and spinning, where we'd been a new reckoning and singing. The first thing to know is fire exists. Then with one's eyes, then with no, then with one's own eyes to be consumed by fire at the end, be consumed by fire at the end. I didn't mean that to be too dark, but <laughs> yeah, that came out of sequester, and um, I wanted to turn to this expanded uh, book that came out this last year, The Songs of the Sons and Daughters of Buddha, Enlightenment Poems from the Theragata and Terigata, uh, translated with Andrew Schelling, a Sanskritist. And we were working with these um, ancient poems that go back to the Buddha. They were um, preserved in Pali, the written language that holds scriptures of foundational Buddhism. And the Teragatha and Terigata are two collections of poetry regarded as having been composed and reciting dur during the lifetime of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha. And around 80 BCE, the poems got transcribed in, in written form, probably cut with a metal stylus into palm leaf manuscripts, which were then washed over with ink at the great Buddhist council in Sri Lanka during the reign of King Vatagamani. And that was circa 89 to 77 BCE. Tradition ascribes most of the poems to direct disciples of Buddha, meaning they had been circulated by word of mouth for 350 years or more. And um, they changed enormously over those periods of, of time. There's no way to recover them as they were when they were first sang. And um, you know, early Buddhists might have added material and so on. But anyway, we wanted to sort of liberate them from some of the, um, I mean, there've been some good translations and versions, but at one point they were, seemed to be, uh, you know, uh, Christianized in ways or made more, more religious. And, and they're often re referred to as the uh, songs and poems of, of nuns and monks, but they were, they were mendicant, traveling mendicants, uh, forest dwellers primarily. This is before, um, you know, the nunneries and, and monasteries. So I'll just um, read a few. This is Mahakala Speaks. And they're all about, you know, suffering impermanence, but finding, uh, you know, the noble path out of uh, impermanence. This is Mahakala Speaks. This lady who cremates the dead, black as a crow, she takes an old corpse and breaks off a thigh bone, takes an old corpse and breaks off a forearm, cracks an old skull and sets it out like a bowl of milk for me to look at. Witless brain, don't you get it? Whatever you do just ends up here. Get finished with karma, get finished with rebirth. No more bones of mine on the slag heap. And here's one of the 
daughters of Buddha, Arakasi. I was a prostitute with fees as large as the whole kingdom of Kasi. The sheriff fixed it. I was priceless, but too many clients came and my value dropped by half. No one was interested anymore, used up, tired, weary, this old body, good for sex, this sex money body. Where does it go? How far does it go? Never again, chasing rebirth after rebirth after rebirth. This is Sumangala's mother. These were also uh, women who they were not, um, you know, young women necessarily. They had had, you know, full lives, um, difficult mother-in-laws and children, children that often died. So they had struggled, but they were, they were, um, you know, not virgin nuns, many of them. So they, they write out of their experience. Sumangala's mother was the wife of a weaver of straw hats. I'm free, free from kitchen, I'm free, free from kitchen drudgery, no longer a slave among dirty cooking pots. My pot smelled like an old water snake and I'm through with my brutal husband and his tiresome sun chains. I purge lust with a sizzling sound, pop. Oh, happiness, meditate upon this as happiness. Here's Siha. She thought of suicide, but gave it up singing. Distracted, too passionate, dumb about the way things work. I was stung and tossed by memories, haunted, you could say. I went on like this, wandering for seven years, thin, pale, desperate, nothing to hold me. Taking a rope, I went to the woods, Hanging is better than this slow life. The noose was strong. I tied it to the branch of a tree, flung it round my neck when suddenly, look, it snapped, not my neck. My heart was free. There's one at the end. And Mara, the tempter, is often appears in these poems, and there's a kind of dialogue between the mendicant and Mara. So this is Sisu Pakala speaks with Mara, the tempter. Sisu Pakala was sure of herself, her senses pure, her perception clear. She drank life's elixir, a sweet fluid, sustaining that replenished her mind. Mara interrupts. Don't forget where you've been before, those other lives you led in bittersweet realms, animals, demons, pretas, your friends, companions. Think about it, long for it. He whispers in her ear, yearn again for the Kamaloka and the seductive beauty of the dark gods who rule in shadow and the blissed out gods who rule by day. They'll take you, caress your naked body. She speaks. Stop, Mara, don't you know those gods go from birth to death to birth to death again, again, become this, become that, become this again, become that. You know the Kama Loka stinks with lust. I tell you the world is blazing, blazing, the whole world's in flames. I tell you it's flared up, the world is shaken, your words are shaken, the whole world's ablaze. So I'll leave that there. Um, now, it's interesting to be working also with these talismanic uh, texts and ideas and geomancy and so on. They often, you know, ends with these images of the, the world being ablaze. And, uh, you know, we're seeing that, of course, in many ways. And I wanted to read next, um, I call it Revolutionary Letter 2021 for Diane de Prima. Diane de Prima, the poet who passed away uh, recently. Uh, her, her book of, I think they're more recent in, in, in the City Lights book, there was an original book of revolutionary letters, but there's an expanded edition of that. And she was writing them at this crucial period in the 60s, um, spending time in the Haight-Ashbury around the diggers and, and um, you know, was a political person, activist, a wonderful poet, um, many, many, um, layers of 
sort of thinking around um, mythology and also um, how to live. And I have this little quote from Aldo Leopold, to preserve the element of unknown places for Diane. Dear regenerative agriculture, come our way. All the extra carbon could be taken care of in a degrowth utopia. Concern that we are just procedural, know your soil. Just so you know, Diane de Prima had full body spirit of outrage. She was transmitting groundedness, although she studied angelicity and systems of dialectic art. She was a shield and she was sanctuary. She knew the skandhas, never a hall of mirrors. She opened the field, justice for all, an ecology of practice and mind. She knew sunset, sunrise, crimson hues of dawn, moonset, moonrise, how you waited, know their tongues, what they speak to you and what the thunder said. Do you want blood to come out of me? Chaos of storm and of fire learned the lessons of sorrow and she tithed time. Come with your punctuation, your Dharma vow. Be ready to evacuate. Enough for 10 days survival, keep simple, have a place to stay, read the invisible committee, Ashile Menembe, the Zapatista reader, full body burden, the Akashic records, sunken sons by Etel Adnan. Who stands in the sun who is meant for these firestorms? Loba, ask this every day, create a shrine of intention as she did every day. And in her revolutionary letters, she's often giving instructions, you know, what you should pack uh, when you have to survive somewhere uh, out in the desert, what to carry with you if you have to run away from the, the heat, the police. And that line, who stands in the sun, who is meant for these firestorms is from her long poem, Loba, which um, sort of celebrates the she-wolf through many um, of permutations of that myth. So let's see what time it is. I think I'll read a little bit from Trickster Feminism. And this is, this was um, around, this was watching too much of uh, election news on, um, on the screens. <laughs> uh, the last time I went to, I was actually at Harvard was right before the, Trump and Clinton run off. And I remember to, you know, begging with the audience, just listen to me, listen to me. It's not a, you know, Hillary Clinton's not going to, it's not a done deal. And uh, you know, there's a kind of attitude, I guess I could put it that way, um, from some of the students not thinking maybe, you know, what a, what a crucial election that, that was for our, civilization for our humanity. This is called Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra's body polis ticks. And there's a quote here from Nicholas Guillen, Sensamaya, the snake, Sensamaya, Sensamaya with its eyes, Sensamaya. And from Donna Haraway, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. So this is invoking Clytemnestra and, um, and she speaks in a way, this poem. Be such a strong fact, you would sleep of those I kill, milk running over. Name a variant of scheme, to act, not hurt, a body. Render it barren, bodies politic, nor spill dripping rain. Athena demands, turn it up, the hungry Syrians. And who is up for rule, a labrys, the double-headed ax for thought, carnage for thought, Suffer eclipse again, can't see, can't see the syndicates, but see their murder spill forth. For want of a brain, yet I have without wine succumbed this crazy politic, unhooked the little box world. Men are stumping their speeches, white bodies in the horror void whose desiccated lips spew oil. I can't be media for want of a brain. Stains set you free after betting secret pacts and deals. Go crazy with conspiracy. I always vote beside the hearth. Keep my house alive. Be not a murderer of sleep. Block at the feet. 
heart eyes. For want of a brainstem, the nukes go free. All my arrows were the candidates. Ur this, the ur that, the ur person, aggrandizement. The self goes down in augury with a nuked family history. For one of a society, the bees run free. For one of a fibula, the world strums. Sisters elect of, elect of our wonder, a barker, pearls and blue beads, cobalt stuff, a prison outfit. For one of obstruction, run free, oh, body and chains. And the other one had a cufflink, perhaps. Will others don, will swear? Keep an upright way, I'm a wrecker, a wrecker. America, pancake, makeup, and pundits, and sway to a better idea. Make no mistake, when greater disaster comes, robber baron is all you are. Helm of my psychic state will not go gentle. Out of the, the riches yet, mind grips for the temps on strike in Michigan. This is not a red state. This is the seat of palace, alive in the estates of the father. Enough, cry hold, poison darts, and they come from a mocking tree in ritual misadventure upon all who stroll across O's. Hunted beast slips from our nets. Gone to San Bogakaya, the timeless body of light. Won't sleep with me no more, no more, no more, no more for want of a bed. Charioteers go on strike for want of a whip. Mount the statue of Athene and her plebe, suckle at bitter breast, eyes with blood who cannot see, it's plain to see. Stain and power, the activist streets, receive your call in secrecy of night. Spring clear for want of an ear, hear what it calls to all minions, resist, retort, reclaim, for want of tongue the world trembles. You cannot get my dream, O oh, furies, for want of imagination, whimper you must, for want of an ark, you cannot get me an ark. For one of the sea, for one of my solace, a kind of dramaturgy. Go, Hermes, help me pour these lustral waters, or get up feet. For one of a mother snake, or hound whose thought of hunting has no shape. Sick em, sick em, let go, bloodshot breath, vitals heat, the dumb TV wake and speak severally, no more promises. In the town hall, you want plurality. Try a whole matricidal chorus pumped up for this, for one of a forum. Let stabbing voice of the Etruscans speak. Let her breathe. A single ballot can restore a treehouse. Oh, God of the younger generation, under pods of future cruelty, serpent power of sinewy cruelty, or staggering beast wore out its time. Oh, damn the land and bring your ton of hatred upon it. Tyranny, not bring your bulk of hatred on anything really, but civility. Civility, I promised you what? This void. I promise you a place in the sacrosanct booth. Jagged loners eat the seeds, but I'll accept all devotions by you, citizens. And then there's a line in Russian I can't read, which says a bear will not touch a dead body. And there was all this talk of Russia in the election. Um, and I'll end with a little bit of uh, Mel Pomene, also from, from Trickster Feminism. There had been catastrophe. There would be catastrophe. The time in which a man lived was a whirl or drift in a great sea that might rise out of itself into a roaring end of things. And then I have, this is a dream of, of Robert Duncan's from the HD book. What returned to my thought as I began work this morning was the revelation of the stars. For the dream, Muriel Rukeyser, the poetess of the major arcana of my own dream tarot, took us out to see the night sky. All the stars of the cosmos had come forth from the remotest regions into the visible. At first, I was struck by the brilliance of Orion. But as I looked, the field was crowded with stars, dense cells of images, and then almost animal constellations of the night sky. It was as if we saw the whole overpopulated species of man and in that congregation of the living and dead, the visible and the invisible members of the whole, we began to make out patterns of men, animal entities whose cells were living souls. We see those skies here, the poet has said, because we are very close to the destruction of the world. Against catastrophe, in front of it, to placate, to scorn. Small creature breathes life, or a sea urchin told me this from the vine. Our symbiogenesis speaks, small and slithery, how they stink, the child said. Hoped, will it laugh? 
give out various Venuses, penates, household gods inside, place of refuge, protection, not a bridge for a tomb, end that is imploded event, fable to diminish all fables, serpentine roads to Damascus. Odd how holiest of places turned hells. A tragic muse warns you away. Mammoth, ivory, entwined antlers, blue moon, slant of time of change, wandering once, those hipster planets seem cooler in scorn to road our way, awaiting their own crimped extinction. Did we, he, they, thy, you, you, who, what did I, me, them, she, she, it, it ever say? It would be easy, expedient, no fixed determinator in metaphysic, work by the sweat of brow moment dormant replicant at ready. This is the antithesis reality missed in the cosmos ventilator at ready. Stones fall on the earth. Was the word before this or all oral already? A fascist salute, loud at ready. Sound turned up as science turns down a notch to match a warming rejection. No verification without apparatus, extend tears, art over art over and over art acoustic, yet her silence shivers at the ready. Wasn't it a sly detriment, constellation and tears? She had a steel bracelet we torture around her waist, hot metal scale positioned above the head, horns butted forth, ram forcing a mechanism. All fortunes fell down turned monster of speed, a movement of whirling system made tender when we held stem of scope as tender might thrive outside the planet terrarium and point made about wealth of nations. Look there, weapons of doom, deflate, de deflagrations, points, looking there, weirder graces, vex mel pomene, under sites of AI recognition construction, conflagrations that posit mind back to scope and privilege, that there should be a consciousness in the first place the heaps of Abhidharmas to reckon as ego builds her palace on shaky ground metabolically needing tenderer bird wing shelter, shelter else predator eagle hawk crow devours in her depiction of self of agency. Track three long days when you were epic, when you were divination, when you read the runes, dialectics and tragedy, gambled with pronged antelope on way to yellow mountain, see yourself prolonged in language. Kurdish riot girl, hijab as act of resistance, ruse to subvert burlesque clothing or war, death and burial. Are you ready? Saboteur on the wild side before the technology told you where you are, where you stopped to protest under surveillance, mourning the stateless Rohingya. And I was in the condition of Tumo, warmed in sub-zero life, which literally means fierce woman and inner fire. Chandali to cozy up a mountain, walk backward into the jar. Inestimable, duress, etched in access, adroitness, in sullenness, etched with scars, starless, stringent, sumptuous, without motive, without less motion, less for a moment, pra, 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 progress, its essence, its essential foil, and misnomer, the S or orlessness or rudderlessness take the drift of capriciousness, a blameless eldress where I digress, caress me, the S of secretion, the scorpion on its rounds, your sentiment under keenness, kindredness, dragging essential into existence before annulled in eminence, before it becomes essence exposed. All binaries in question, esprit, core, animal, human, organism, machine, nature, culture, public, privé, the male, the female, artiste, carriériste, la vie, économique, all dispersed, all broken down, reconfigured, interpolated upon, folded, folded. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Drones over Jordan, coming after me, got those Anthropocene, Anthropocene blues. I looked into my crystal ball, what did I see? Cadres of humans taking to the streets, changing the frequency. I got those Anthropocene, Anthropocene blues. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anne. What a treat to hear you read live. Uh. <laughs> there were quite a bit things that were sort of related to, to have some consistency, but thank you for the invitation to try out this work. And thank you for your voice and your activism over all these years. Um, Mark, and it was really an honor for us to, to have you here at the Goyler. So on behalf of our little team here, we really wanna thank you for giving us your time. It's, it's um, you know, the support and enthusiasm of, of established poets like yourself that allow us to remain a vibrant little hub for nurturing the next generation of poets. Um, so thank you. Uh, everyone else, thank you for joining us. And our next reading will be June 10th and will feature Catherine Hollander, um, sorry, Rowan Ricardo, and who's the last person? Oh, and Jennifer Militello. So we hope you will join us for that. Um, this is mom. This is Carol Minkiti. I just want to thank you all so much for reading. I happened to be on the train coming to Washington and my son quickly put, put me on your, on my, on his cell phone so I could hear a lot of the reading. Thank you so much. We're so grateful for your reading tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being there. <laughs>